This video is sponsored by Squarespace, yeah. Maintain a caloric surplus, resistance train a minimum of three times per week, hit failure on some sets. Maintain a caloric surplus whilst consuming a minimum of 0.8 grams of protein per pound of body weight. Resistance train four times or more per week while sticking to a consistent workout split. Hit failure on your final set of each exercise. Maintain a caloric surplus of around 150 to 300 calories whilst consuming a minimum of around 0.8 grams of protein per pound of body weight. Resistance train four times or more per week whilst following a training split that has you hitting each major muscle group twice per week. Choose three core compound lifts to track and make a conscious effort to increase the weights you're using where you can. Take most sets close to failure. Maintain a caloric surplus of around 150 to 300 calories whilst consuming a minimum of 0.8 grams of protein per pound of body weight and trying to distribute that protein equally over four meals throughout the day. Train five times per week and follow a structured program that covers a variety of rep ranges on the endurance to strength scale with the majority of work being done in the eight to 12 rep range. Hit each major muscle group at least twice per week with a minimum of 10 sets per week per muscle group but ideally closer to 20. Take all working sets at least to within 5 reps from failure, with the vast majority ending up between 1 and 3 reps from failure. Track all primary compound movements and apply progressive overload either through self-regulating reps and or weight used, or as part of a percentage reps in reserve or rate of perceived exertion system built into the aforementioned program. Take creatine. Maintain a caloric surplus of 150 to 300 calories whilst consuming a minimum of 0.8 grams of protein and 0.4 grams of fat per pound of body weight, with that protein distributed equally over 4 or 5 meals at regular intervals throughout the day. Go beyond your typical recommended daily amounts of micronutrients, train at least 5 times per week and follow a specifically tailored periodized program that focuses on your strengths and weaknesses and has you hit in each major muscle group at least twice twice per week with a minimum of 20 sets per week per muscle group and the bulk of the working sets in the 8 to 12 rep range. Exercises within said program should be selected partly but not solely based on EMG data where available. Take all working sets at least to within 5 reps from failure with the vast majority ending up between 1 and 3 reps from failure but refraining from absolute failure too frequently with the inclusion of drop sets and pause rest sets to facilitate an appropriate intensity. Track all lifts and apply progressive overload either through self-regulating reps and or weight used or as part of a percentage one rep max reps in reserve or RPE system built into the aforementioned program. Take creatine, a sports orientated multivitamin, some fish oil or other DPA and EHA capsules and use a pre-workout containing citrulline malate. Ensure at least seven hours of sleep per night. Refrain from excessive alcohol consumption. Train with a training partner. Ensure proper form on all exercises and consult somebody with a biomechanics background for coaching if in any doubt, paying specific attention to core compound lifts. Now, before we get ahead of ourselves, I'm gonna go back to the average commitment level, the one where I think most people are gonna land there or thereabouts. And I'm gonna elaborate a little bit on that. So let's go from the start. Maintain a caloric surplus of around 150 to 300 calories. So there's two main reasons why this is a scale rather than a specific number, I can just tell you. The first is that people have different potentials for how fast they are able to build muscle. There are factors such as age, genetics, how long you've been lifting and a few other things. So. A 35 year old male who has been lifting for five years would not have the same potential for growth as an 18 year old newbie who's been in the gym for six months. He may therefore choose to bulk on a more shallow surplus. The second is simply because some people are more comfortable with gaining body fat than others, whereas some would rather keep calories to a point where they maybe sacrifice a little bit of speed in terms of the muscle building process in order to retain a bit of leanness at and keep that body fat to a minimum. Another thing to mention is of course the size of the individual to begin with. So if you're five foot, you just have a smaller frame to put muscle on than someone who's six foot two. It obviously has to be somewhat relative to your overall stature. 
To give a generalized example that I think will apply to most people, if you're between 18 and your mid to late 20s and between 150 and 180 pounds, aim for a 200 calorie surplus as a general benchmark. So the magic number you're after here is a number of calories that would ensure maximum muscle gain without any fat gain. However, that number would only exist if your body performed those processes in order. So for example, if your excess calories went solely towards muscle building, then later, once that was all complete, you started gaining fat. That's not the case. What will actually happen is that any excess calories will be divided between muscle gain and fat gain. Assuming your training is adequate, we can safely say that the higher your surplus, the more that ratio will be tilted in favor of fat gain. So instead of aiming solely for muscle gain, which might be impossible, what we're actually aiming for is an acceptable ratio of muscle to fat gain. In terms of specific rates of weight gain, again, this is going to vary depending on the factors I mentioned earlier because it is closely tied to the individual's potential for muscle growth. Now, most people, myself included, are fairly wary of adding ranges or, or giving people specific numbers to this because you don't want someone to think that if they are somehow above this range, then they must be doing something wrong and are inevitably gaining a load of fat. There are a lot of factors that need to be tracked when you're judging your progress. So if we're gonna roll with the example from before, let's say an 18 to 25 year old who's 150 to 180 pounds, I would say two to 2.5, maybe up to three pounds per month of body weight as an increase. So there will inevitably be some fat within those two to three pounds. However, I would deem that an amount that is worth it because it's not actually too difficult to lose that amount of fat later. Now, of course, your weight gain in the first month might be a little bit higher because you will see changes in your body weight that aren't directly related to body composition. For example, if you all of a sudden increase your carb intake, your weight will spike within the first few days. After that few days to a week, it should settle into a more general trend. Consume 0.8 grams of protein per pound of body weight. Okay, I'm gonna skip over this one because I and probably everybody else on YouTube have talked about optimal protein intake a million times. I could flash up some studies on the screen if I wanted to. Let's all save ourselves the effort and just say 0.8 grams of protein per per pound of body weight is adequate for basically everyone. If you wanna push that up to one gram of protein per pound of body weight due to dietary preferences, OCD, you just like round numbers, that's great. One case where I would say that is probably a good idea is if your bulking calories and carbs are quite high, what happens is a lot of the time your protein intake gets made up from trace proteins. So there's a few grams of protein in a piece of bread, there's some protein in oats, there's some protein in pretty much everything you eat. And what happens if your carbs are really high is that it ends up that a lot of your total protein intake gets made up from these trace proteins. Now these are often but not always incomplete protein sources in terms of their amino acid profile. Now whilst they are still of course protein, I would go out on a limb and say the higher proportion of your total protein intake that is made up from complete protein sources, that is going to be better overall for muscle building. Now of course your body composition will also affect your protein requirements because if you're 50% body fat and you're 200 pounds, you don't don't need 200 or 160 grams of protein because you don't need protein to maintain that adipose tissue half your body weight. So let's go with a, a generalized example. If you're about 170 to 180 pounds and you're between 12 and 20% body fat, you're probably good with 145 to 160 grams of protein. Resistance train four or more times per week whilst following a training split that has you hitting each major muscle group twice per week. Honestly, you could make gains training three times a week for sure. However, I would say that going from three times a week to four times a week is probably probably the biggest jump you get from increasing training frequency because that allows you to go from a push pull leg split training everything once per week to an upper lower upper lower split training everything twice in the week. I would also say going from four to five days if you can is worth it and that would be the point where I think you start to see diminished returns. I don't think going from five days to six days a week gives you the same returns as going from three to four or four to five because you then really are starting to eat into your recovery time and only giving yourself one rest day a week if your program is fairly intense and quite compound heavy that might potentially be problematic so if you're going to train four times a week i would do an upper lower upper lower split and if you're going to train five i would probably do a push pull legs upper lower split final thing to note is that you can't make up for frequency with more volume so let's say you do 20 sets on chest per week you will see better gains if you do 
10 sets on Monday and 10 sets on Thursday than if you just do 20 sets on Monday. So that increased frequency, even when volume is equated for, is worth doing. Track your core compound lifts and make a conscious effort to increase where possible. I suggest as a bare minimum choosing three main lifts and keeping a record of your weight used and reps performed for each set. Now primarily this would be there as an overall indication of your strength progress on the whole. So you would use those three lifts and infer that, oh, if I'm getting stronger on these three lifts, I'm generally going in the right direction for this bulk. It'll give you a good kick up the arse in terms of accountability and making you actually conscious of what you're lifting rather than walking into the gym, seeing how you feel that day choosing a random rep range and a random weight, you know. I would say after my first couple of years of making newbie gains, starting to actually track my lift was probably the most important change I made to my training, along with obviously starting to follow an actual program, but obviously most programs will have your progression factored into them anyway, so they would come together. Take most sets close to failure. Okay, this is a very condensed and oversimplified way of ensuring some level of appropriate intensity to your workout. So you don't want to take every set to failure. You might not want to take any set to actual failure. That's a whole nother conversation. But you do want to get close to failure on the majority of your sets. If you go with that as a general rule of thumb, that would honestly be enough. That would suffice. I'm going to link a video that Jeff Nipper did relating to some research on effective reps and it's actually very fucking sick. I'll link it in the, in the description so you can check that out if you want. So I'm not going to go into detail on the further levels of commitment but if you do have questions you can slam them in the comments and I will get back to you. Instead what I'm going to do is move on to what I would consider to be more practical considerations of bulking or lean bulking. Now there is obviously the theory side of it which is very fucking important however Theory needs to be put in a human context, so there are human considerations, and uh, I think that is equally as important. So what I did was asked people on my Instagram if there's anything particular that they struggle with, and these are the top five things. Getting in enough calories without eating shit. So the first thing to mention is that eating healthy should be primarily focused on consuming enough nutrient dense foods rather than just abstaining from what you would deem as junk food. A deficiency in any specific nutrient is gonna be a much greater hindrance to you than simply eating too much cookies and chocolate. So with that in mind, provided you're eating enough vitamins and minerals, some fruit, some green veg here and there, stuff like that, that is the main thing. Now that doesn't mean make up the rest of your diet with turkey dinosaurs, but it means once you've covered that base, you can worry less about what you make up the rest of your diet with. What you essentially need to do is the opposite of when you're cutting and trying to stick to your calories. So instead of seeking out high satiety foods, i.e. foods that are filling but low in calorie, what you wanna do is the opposite of that. You wanna seek out foods that are high calories and not very filling. Now, granted, if you wanna do that whilst avoiding junk, it is massively going to limit your options because the majority of those foods are stuff like processed foods, shit that's you know deep fried, anything like that. But there are ways to do it without resorting to that. So just a few off the top of my head. First one, I've said it a thousand times, I'll say it again, eat dates. They don't have to be the expensive medjool variety. Pretty much any dates are gonna be super high in calories, super high in carbs and not particularly filling. You could also extend that to dry fruit in general so you can add sultanas to everything or whatever you wanna do. You wanna swap out things like oats for granola or muesli alternatives. Swap out potatoes for less filling carbs like rice or pasta. Milk for whole milk, low fat yogurt for not low fat yogurt, eggs for whole eggs, slam olive oil and everything, put peanut butter and everything. And on that note, don't be afraid to increase your fat if you struggle to get your calories in. The main thing, once you've hit your micronutrient requirements, your protein and your fats, is just getting in your total calories to what they need to be. Now, I would much rather you just went higher in fats than struggle all day, every day trying to get five, 600 grams of carbs in. Anyway, I'll leave that there. Let me know if you want me to make a video on some high calorie meals and snacks. The psychological block of gaining fat. Now, people who've been fat previously tend to have more of an issue with this. You know, they've spent all this time trying to lose all this weight, they've done it, and they have this fear of going back when you don't want to go back there. I understand that is completely understandable. For those people, what I would say is, firstly, make sure you're in a good position 
to start your cut. Now, if you're basically skinny fat, you don't have much muscle mass, I would definitely not recommend getting like super lean before you start a cut. You don't wanna be trying to get down to 8% body fat because it's gonna be massively unproductive and just a terrible use of your time. But realistically, you should be looking at the low teens, maybe even touching 12% body fat-ish. If you've got any specific areas that you're self-conscious about, so you've got a little bit of fat on your belly, you really do wanna make a good dent in that before you start your bulk because all you're gonna do is see that gradually increasing just because it induce massive amounts of anxiety. Secondly, obviously be more conservative with your calories than other people. If that puts your mind at rest, then it's certainly fine to just bulk in a 100 calorie, 150 calorie surplus and just see really slow gains because progress in itself, however fast or slow, is still really satisfying. And so if you do have to sacrifice a bit of speed and bulk for a bit longer, then that's completely worth getting this worry off your back. Lastly, you do need to accept that some fat gain is inevitable. Now, obviously me telling you that you need to accept it isn't gonna actually help you to accept it because it's not an actual choice that you have, it's involuntary. It's like me telling you to believe in Bigfoot. You're not just going to because I told you to. It's just the way your mind leans involuntarily based on your knowledge and experiences. However, let me tell you this in the hope that it provides you with some solace. Mental shifts take time, but with an open mind and some conscious thought, they do happen. Each year you should hopefully become a little bit wiser, a little bit more experienced, and your irrational fears should gradually loosened their grip so hopefully that's encouraging go forth young padawan sticking to calories okay so this is essentially the opposite of not being able to get enough calories in but it was just as common and it's also something that i have personally experienced too and it's really a combination of things that make it really difficult to stick to your bulking calories for some people the first one is that you just came off a cut in most cases and so overeating after that period of starvation you've been through is completely natural and that overeating period takes different amounts of time for different people personally it takes me a while i will overeat for a couple of months and the only reason i get away with not gaining incredible amounts of fat is because i just super pump up my activity train like fuck, do a shit ton of cardio and try and offset it as much as possible. The second reason why it's difficult to stick to your calories is because you have this psychological green light of being on a bulk now. You've had the red light for so long because you were on a court, you can't eat this, you can't eat that. And now it's all fucking go. You know, you're bulking. So you tell yourself this story of, if I overeat, it's not that bad because it's probably just good for my bulk. And that's a weak ass rationalization. But, you know, you have your logical self and your rationalizing self and your rationalizing self will come up with a bullshit story and your logical self will eat it right up because it wants to believe. You know full well that it is not productive to hammer down a full pack of Jaffa Cakes on top of your daily calories, but the logical you up in there is happy to be deceived. So what can you do about it? Well, since this is the same question as how do you stick to your calories when cutting, it has the same answers. Obviously what we said previously about satiating food, stuff that's filling, even intermittent fasting isn't out of the question. If that is something that's helped you stick to your calories on a cut, it may also help you do that on a bulk. I personally don't fast, but I do load a lot of my calories and carbs towards the back end of the day so I can have a good feast before I go to bed. Essentially that is just a binge without binging. So it's a binge within your calories. And a lot of the time that is all intermittent fasting really is, isn't it? It's people saving up their binge. You're not overcoming the need to do it. You know, you haven't conquered it. You're just saving it up rectifying a binge. So this kind of follows on from the last one, except instead of how to prevent, it's rather how to rectify. So binge eating is most commonly associated with when you're in a dieting phase, because that's when it's most likely to occur. However, most of us, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, bulk over winter and what happens over winter? Christmas happens and if you don't binge eat at least a few times over the Christmas period, you're an animal mate. You're probably a proper weirdo, you know what I mean? You probably wear fleeces and stuff. So the question is, what do you do next? Now, the usual routine when you're cutting is to reduce your calories for the next few days, and maybe increase your calorie expenditure through higher activity levels than usual. But if you do that same process when you're bulking, is it going to hinder your actual bulk? I don't think so. You see, the idea of being in a caloric surplus or a deficit, at least how it's most commonly 
thought of and pictured is probably a little bit flawed because it's not a balanced sheet. There's no bottom line and cut off point where it's all tallied up. Essentially, you are always in a constant flux of surplus and deficit. Right after you eat, you're in a surplus. Even if you've been cutting for months and then you have a big meal, right after that meal, you're in a surplus, just not for very long. If you've been asleep for eight hours overnight, you're probably in a deficit. So what a bulk actually is, is just a period of time over which your cumulative surpluses outweighs your cumulative deficit. So if you've just had a mad binge, are you really gonna suffer from reducing your calories for a couple of days? No, not really. Because for a start, you are absolutely full of glycogen and so your training shouldn't be affected whatsoever. And if you go into a deficit for a couple of days, does that mean that you can't build muscle during those two days? I would say most certainly not. Spending a prolonged time in a deficit is going to make it hard, in some cases impossible, to build any significant amount of muscle. However, if you've been bulking for a couple of months and then you nip into a deficit for a couple of days just to undo some gluttony, common sense would suggest that you'll basically be able to continue your bulk as normal. So my advice would be the same as if you binge during a cut. Reduce your calories a little bit, go down to just below maintenance, add a bit of cardio, make sure your workouts are bang on. Crack on, mate, don't worry. Dealing with slow progress slash having a little cry because I'm impatient, mate. So progress when bulking is much less apparent than when you're cutting. Bulking has been described as the delayed gratification of lifting. And that's not just because you build muscle more slowly than you can lose fat but it's also because you don't actually see the muscle that you've built until way after you finish your bulk because you inevitably have a little bit of fat gain from that bulk and so you don't really see your gains until not just the end of your bulk but also the end of your next cut and that really is a fucking long slog but guess what you don't just gain some muscle you also gain a valuable fucking life lesson and that's ideal isn't it so the main thing to remember is that your visual appearance isn't the sole indicator of your bulk's success or failure. And if that is the only metric by which you are judging your progress, you will likely not be getting the most out of your bulk. Your strength and your body weight should obviously be tracked closely too. Now again, strength is a funny one because people will often go through periods where their lifts aren't really going up and they will get disheartened. But let me say this, if you are sticking to a decent program, training at a good level of intensity, and your body weight is going up, you can safely assume that a good proportion of that body weight is due to increases in lean mass, okay? Muscle gains, how much depends on a lot, but it will definitely be some, even if you're not strictly seeing strength improvements week on week. Now, of course, if your lifts never moved and you literally went from one year to the next without gaining any strength over any rep range, you would plateau and muscle gains would be at a minimum. But in the short term, if your lifts stall for a couple of weeks or even a little longer, it's not a reason to poo your pants. Now much of this boils down to the whole trust the process kind of thing. If you are consistently doing the fundamentals, even just all of the things I listed under the average commitment level and no further than that, the next thing to do is literally get out of your head and crack on. Don't let overthinking rob you of progress. Just get your head down, crack on, trust the process. And if you can't trust the process, trust Joey D. See you later. Finally, another big thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring this video, and if you don't know what Squarespace do, then you haven't watched enough of my videos, which is mildly offensive, but I'll tell you anyway. Squarespace is where you go if you need a website, a domain, an online store, blog, etc. You can use one of their almost infinite cool templates as a starting point and then dress it up however you like in their style editor and change basically anything so that you come out with an original and unique looking website, which will also automatically adapt so it looks good on mobiles and other devices too. But it ain't just about looks because the functionality is also there they have some sick SEO tools to help you make your site more discoverable in searches and you can also use their appointment scheduling feature if you need clients to book appointments if you're a PT or anything like that so if you think that sounds ideal mate you can go to squarespace.com for a free trial and then squarespace.com forward slash Joe Delaney for 10% off your first purchase when you are ready to go all right ciao I'm out see ya Joe Delaney is my hero